And he says, and brag about your relationship to God, that they're God's chosen people, that he seems to have chosen to talk to the world through Jewish people. And so they thought, you know, we're special. We have something on other people that they don't have because we're Jewish and God likes us more than you. And then he says, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, that they know God's will, they know how we're supposed to live, and they're supposed to teach one another how to do this. And then he says, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of infants, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. So that's really the heart of the Jews, that they believe because God gave them the law. They have something up on other people. And this religious pride and arrogance got to the point that they would actually call a person who wasn't a Jew a dog, like they were subhuman than them because they had something special that God had given them. So the point is, is what we see here is because God gave them the Jewish religion, because God gave them the law, it still didn't transform their hearts. They still had hardness. They still had arrogance. They still were selfish and prideful. And so religion doesn't necessarily make us better people, friends. And that's one of the things that that as we're in church right now, we have to understand this, that just being in church or being a member of Canyon View Vineyard Church or whatever church you belong to, it doesn't necessarily make you a better person. Being a regular attender of church doesn't make you a better person. Being in a church where you have a bald-headed Latino worship leader and a little Oriental guy that wears weird shirts, that doesn't make you any better. I hate to bust your bubble. And this is similar to what was happening in the Jews. And so then Paul cross-examines them. He kind of puts them on the stand. In verse 21 through 24, he says, You then, who teach others... Do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who brag about the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. And what that's saying here is, is the hypocrisy of the Jews, of the religious, made a mockery of God to the non-Jews. And you know what? We've done the same thing with God, with Christianity, with our own hypocrisy. It's interesting you think, well, it, you know, we could spend eternity talking about what Paul's talking about here, this, this issue of stealing. I don't steal. Do you know in Malachi 3, Scripture says that you steal from God by not bringing your whole tithe into the storehouse. Ooh, ooh, that kind of steps on some toes, doesn't it? You say that people should not commit adultery, but you commit adultery. Jesus said, you look at a woman in lust, dude, you've committed adultery. You abhor idols, do you rob temples? There's so many ways that we elevate things of our life and our world and our, our possessions, even our family, to a higher degree than God. And that's where idolatry comes in. And so being religious on the outside does not mean that we have some kind of honorable purity on the inside. That's the issue. That if we would really, if every one of us would be able to take out our hearts and go, here's my heart, you can look at it, most of us would go, I don't want to do that. 
I don't want people to see my heart. I don't want people to know what I do in secret, even though God knows, right? And this, is, this is what Paul's talking. So as you can see, this, this Romans 2, it's not a feel-good chapter, is it? it? It's something that we read and we go, oh my gosh, that's me. I hope that's what it's doing. I, I think that's a purpose of it. It's interesting, crosswalk.com said that, listen to this, 50% of men viewed pornography within one week after attending a Promise Keeper stadium event. Another survey, pastors.com survey, said that 54% of pastors said they viewed pornography within the past year. That's people in the church, friends. How many of us fudge on our income tax? How many of us report all of our income? There's just so many ways that we could just go on and on where we just say, you know, there are areas that I cut the corners. There are areas that I'm not truly integritous. The Torah... The, the Mosaic Law, there are 613 laws written in the first five books of the Bible. 613. Why did God do that? It, it really is. It's God's prescription. If you want to be holy, if you want to be totally pure, you have to follow these 613 laws your whole life from beginning to end. If you read through the first five books of the Bible, you will start seeing very quickly, you probably only can get to law number two or three before you realize, oh, broke that one. And that's what Paul is talking about, that there is no way for us to follow the law. And that's what Jesus was confronting in Luke eleven forty six as he's talking to the religious guys. He says, and you experts in the law, woe to you because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry, and you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. So what he's talking about is here's their 613 Mosaic laws from the Torah, but then the rabbis added on law after law after law of their interpretations of these 613 laws. There were hundreds and hundreds extra rabbinical laws. And that's what Jesus is saying. Man, you, you guys are just loading this burden of all these rules on the people, and you're, you can't even live up to them yourself. And I think one of the things that happens is, is we judge one another according to these laws that we have that... that I think there are certain laws that we kind of think, you know, I've got that nailed. I, I'm good in this area. And so what do we do? We judge other people who aren't good in that area because we know I'm better than them. But we ignore other laws that we don't want to talk about because we know we're not following them. That's hypocrisy, isn't it? But that's what we do. Really, if, if we're all, I do it. I, like I said, I just judged another pastor for missing the rapture. I'm just mad because he wasn't right. As soon as seeing this, uh, there's, there's a pastor, in a, and I know I'm walking on a thin line here, in, in Canyon City, he's a new guy, who publicly was bashing the Canyon City vineyard, that he had all these things that they have been doing wrong because they have a building, and churches shouldn't have a building, and they do things to bring in unchurched people into the church. They do fun things to bring people into the church so that they can hear the gospel, and, and he says, we shouldn't do that because, because the church is a holy place, and, and he goes, and they even had a Super Bowl party, <laughs> but, but then he talked about the small groups that they have, that the people are encouraged to meet together. And he says, that's relational addiction. And I was listening to this guy going, this guy 
has lost it. But then again, I was thinking, Lord, I'm judging him, and I'm thinking I'm more right than he is, that maybe there's some things he's right about. I, don't, I didn't hear anything that I thought he was right about, but maybe there is. But, but that's the thing. It's so easy for us to judge one another about who's religious and who's not. Then he goes on in verse 25. He talks about circumcision. The circumcision has value if you observe the law, but if you break the law, you'll become as though you had not been uncircumcised. If there's anyone younger in here and you don't know, don't know what circumcision is, ask your mother when you get home. You better ask your dad better. <laughs> if those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you who, even though you have the written code and circ circumcision, are a lawbreaker. A man is not a Jew if he is only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly. And circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the Spirit not by the written code. Such a man's praise is not from men, but from God. Last time I went to Israel, I got Corey, the pastor of Canaan City Vineyard, I got him some boxer shorts. And it says, I'm Jewish, you want to check? <laughs> I told you I'm sick. But I... But to a Jew, circumcision was the most important thing for a man. It was the external evidence that they are chosen by God, that they have favor from God. But what happened was they strictly limited it to the physical evidence. And they didn't take it to the circumcision of the heart. And that's the challenge for everyone in this room is have we allowed God, by the Spirit of God, to circumcise our hearts, meaning that God has revealed the severity of our sin and our brokenness and our depravity compared to a holy, awesome, righteous God. You see the difference? That's who we should be comparing ourselves, not among one another, not among this church to another church, not this religion to another religion, but the only one we should be comparing ourselves to is a holy and righteous God. And so when we do that, we understand that we ain't doing too good. And that's as Jeremiah 4.4, 4, this is when the circumcision of a heart comes. He says, circumcise yourself to the Lord. Circumcise your hearts. You men of Judah and people of Jerusalem, are my wrath will break out and burn like fire because of the evil you have done, burned with no one to quench it. So what happens is when we become circumcised to the heart, is we're brought to the place of repentance. We're brought to the place of saying, God, you are holy and I'm not. And God then, through the work of the Holy Spirit, the, the Holy Spirit becomes a, like, a spiritual surgeon and he begins to work on areas of our heart that he wants to transform, that he wants to make more like him, because then it becomes a relationship of love. That when we receive God's grace, he begins to transform us. John 14, 21 says, whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. See, being able to follow God's commands, we don't do it to obtain favor from God. We don't do it to make us righteous. God makes us righteous because we can't make ourselves righteous. we got to get that down. And that's what Romans is talking about, is we need 
God's salvation. We need God's forgiveness because we all fall short. And so then as the Holy Spirit convicts us, he begins to transform us. Going back to Monday night as I'm laying in bed and Jane gives me that question, so are you going to talk to me or are you going to read from your stupid iPad? I wish in my heart automatically Ephesians 5.25 would come into my mind. It says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loves the church and gave himself up for her. I wish I was that righteous. I had to remember that verse later this week thinking like, I wish I would have thought of that then. Because I wasn't thinking righteous thoughts when she asked me that question. Some of you women are thinking, well, what did you do? I also believe in self-preservation. <laughs> I put my iPad away, and I says, what do you want to talk about, honey? You see, we're just not that righteous. We just don't have it yet. And so, as God circumcised our hearts, we come before him and we say, Lord, forgive me, for I am a sinner. Forgive me, Lord, because I have fallen so far short. And then when we do that, you know what happens? Grace becomes so amazing. Have you really grasped and held on to how powerful that truth is? That God forgives us while we were yet sinners for those who have faith in him? That God didn't have to save us. But because of his undying love for you and for me, he gave his life on the cross through his son. And through faith in the work of Christ, we can come before a holy and righteous God boldly and say, Lord, forgive me and thank you that you have made me righteous in your sight through the work of Jesus Christ. Thank you. That it's not dependent on me because, Lord, I fail every day. And that's when grace comes alive. And when we experience God's grace in that way, God begins to transform our hearts. And you know what? Then we begin to start having grace for one another because we realize I'm not that hot, you're not that hot, and so let's not be that hot together <laughs> and let's live Embracing one another because of his grace. That's when love wins. Does that make sense? And that's what we're going to talk about and go through more as we continue to go through the book of Romans. The worship team come up. You see, this, this is kind of a hysterical kind of an image. But if you watch any of the NBA playoffs right now, uh, LeBron James, six foot eight, 250 pounds. The guy is quick. He's agile. If he jumped right now with me standing here, I'd be reading Nike right here. <laughs> Imagine me on the court with LeBron James, and you're watching this on TV. That would be a hilarious reality show, wouldn't it? I mean, that to think that. I could compare with LeBron James playing one-on-one -on -one basketball is one of the most ridiculous things I can even think of. But now let's just multiply that exponentially by the trillions. That's what it would be like comparing us to God, is that there's no way we can even hold a light to him. But that amazing God loves you. That amazing God gave his son for you. And so he says when we take communion, to take it in remembrance of what he has done for us, that he makes us righteous 
He makes us sinless in His sight. He made it possible for us to boldly go before Him. That's when our faith comes alive, my friends. And so let's stand. And we're going to take communion now, understanding these truths that we've talked about in Romans 2, understanding the power and the magnitude of His goodness and His grace. And so the ushers can come forward to your stations. Come to your left, go out to your left, and the ushers will direct you. Get the bread and get the cup and go back to your seats and meditate as we continue to worship in this song. Then after this song, we will take communion together. Let's worship Him in thankfulness, friends. In my weakness Would you come Help me stand up Help me run To the shadows Of your wings And the comfort
On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, whenever you eat of this, remember my body that was broken for you. And then he took the cup. He said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant. That we are not under the curse of the law anymore. But we now live under the blessing of the new covenant of God's grace. Let's take of the cup in remembrance of his blood that was shed for the washing away of all our sins. Lord, we thank you and we celebrate our life, our new life in you. And we bless you in the name of Jesus. Now we're going to have a ministry team up here for any of you that need prayer. and The worship team will just finish the song. You're welcome to leave if you need to leave. One more song to, to worship him. We welcome you to join us as we finish here. Shadows and dead, your perfect love is casting out fear. And even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, I won't turn back, I know you are near.